Good evening. Welcome back. We're going to um, kick off a new uh, topic in our class um, this week with whistleblowing. Um, before I get into it, though, we've got uh, Davis for tonight. But before I start talking about Davis, a um, couple like uh, businessy items I wanted to address. Uh, the first one was about journals. This last week, I've been really hard pressed on getting through all the grading and stuff. There's been some stuff going on on my end that's made that a little harder. So this last round of journals um, from a week ago, I just got through grading them yesterday. Um, and yeah, yeah, yesterday I got them done. Um, and I definitely didn't give as much feedback as I would like to. And I wanted to kind of just comment on that generally to everyone out there. Um, I've been uh, very intrigued by a lot of what you've been writing about. And it kills me to not uh, spend the time like writing big responses. I did that on a few of them, but um, I just wanted to kind of remind everyone that if you do get your journal graded and you don't get feedback or you don't get as much feedback or about the things that you were hoping to get some feedback about, um, please, please, please feel free to jump and um, ask me for that kind of thing. Um, I will try to make that happen, um, uh, especially if you're asking for it. So. Um, that's always an option that you've got. And if you really value it, if you really value having that conversation, then I want to make that happen for you. That's something I'm, I'm committed to doing as much as I possibly can. But when push comes to shove, I do get into this, um, mode where I'll kind of, um, wait to respond sort of as the spirit moves me. Um, and maybe not on every time my spirit gets moved. Um, so let me know what's happening with you and on your end. And if you're looking for some more feedback, I want to give it to you. Um, but the journals have been very interesting. There was, there were many moments where I was like, oh boy, I'd really love to get into it with this student, uh, and have a big conversation about it. Um, not many people have been calling me. Like, I think I've mentioned this a couple times in the past. Not many people in this class have been calling me or having conversations sort of outside of you know, the, the uh, normal parts of how the class operates. And you're definitely free to do this, even though it's an online class. Um, you know, it's not like you stop by my office hours or something like that, but I've got time during the days, um, and in some of the evenings to, um, be able to talk with you. And I love doing that. I've been doing that a lot with my on-campus students and, and, uh, I think it's a, it can be a very valuable thing. Um, I definitely enjoy it and maybe you'll enjoy it too. Um, there's definitely some uh, very strong opinions out there that I, and I have strong opinions too. So if you just want to debate some of these things, um, I'm happy to be your conversational partner with that. Um, second uh, thing I wanted to touch on here before I get into the lecture um, was just a clarification about the presentations. So, um, oh, that was the other thing I was going to do. Um, and it's not working again. Ooh. Yeah, someone mentioned that the um, microphone sensitivity, like the microphone was coming through kind of quiet. I'll try to speak into it a little bit more. I ratcheted up the sensitivity to make sure that that was going to work right, but then it seemed to default again. I, I set this up a couple nights ago just to test it, and I was able to do that. Um, maybe when I take the break here, I'll take a look at that again and recalibrate it. Um, but in the meantime, I'll talk into the microphone so it's coming through loud and clear. Um, uh, so the other the other business was about the presentation project. So the thing I wanted to clarify is what you have to do and what you don't have to do when you're doing a presentation. So your presentations are going to be tied to a particular reading that you sign up for. And if you're doing a presentation on a reading, then you do not have to do the reading comment assignment on the discussion board for that reading. I will make it excused if you if you don't do it. Um, if you do do it, I'll give you credit for it. So it's still kind of worth doing, but it doesn't hurt you if you don't do it. Um, I, I'm understanding of that because by doing the presentation, you're definitely doing far more than what the um, what the reading comment assignment is looking for you to do anyway. So it's kind of double dipping a little bit. Um, so I, it's fine if you don't do the reading comments on the reading that you are presenting on. Any other readings that are happening during that week, you still have to do reading comment assignments on. So it's only the one that you're presenting on that you don't have to do. Also, 
during the week in which you're giving a presentation, I will I also use the same policy to give you a pass on doing the journal assignment um, if you don't have the time to do that. If you do have the time to do that, then you can do it too, and I'll definitely give you some positive credit for that, and it'll help you out. Um, but if you don't do it, it won't hurt you. Um, so for the week that you're working on your presentation, you don't have to do a journal. Uh, again, because you're doing a lot of similar work for that, and um, I don't want to make it too overwhelming. I do want to encourage you to put um, good effort into your presentation sort of project, which is kind of like a short paper for this online version of the class. Um, as always, if there's anything that you're not sure about, contact me, let me know. Um, it, I was talking with a couple students that made me want to make this announcement and clarify those things for everybody. So definitely if, if there's anything about the instructions I'm giving or, or any ambiguity about the parameters or my policies, please let me know and I'll be happy to answer that. Okay, so getting into whistleblowing and Davis. Um, this topic is a really interesting one. There's... Um, there's a lot of different ways you can go with it, and I and I tried to pick readings for this week that have something a little more original to have to say about whistleblowing, um, while still giving you a good idea of uh, what's sort of the traditional view of whistleblowing, and Davis is a really good example for that, because in Davis's paper, he's explicitly going after what's sort of the standard or traditional account of the ethics of whistleblowing, but also for for Thursday, when we do Duska and Larmer, you'll also see some, I think, kind of original, interesting slants. Um, and not just stuff that's like wacky and from left field, but the kinds of proposals or the kinds of perspectives that seem to really maybe be getting at something, like really deep on this whole whistleblowing thing. But to locate ourselves a little bit, um, I think this is always kind of helpful when we're doing topics in applied ethics, and that's what business ethics is. It's not theoretical ethics. It's about applied issues, particular situations, particular behavior. It's always good to kind of be locating ourselves about like, who are we talking about? Or what sort of setting are we addressing? With the fiduciary duty debate, we were talking about the role of managers as sort of decision makers on behalf of a business or a corporation. So in the process, we were talking about the responsibilities of businesses themselves that then the managers or the directors of that business would have to be sensitive to in their decision making, but also sort of thinking about it from the standpoint of if you're a manager, if you're in that position, and this sort of re maybe relationship, this fiduciary relationship with stockholders, um, what sort of special um, obligations might you be under because of those circumstances? Um, sorry, I'm going to have to keep switching around my video when people drop in and out <laughs> to make it fit. Okay, there we go. Um, so that was with fiduciary duty. It was all about like decisions at the big picture level about how a business is operating, um, what should be informing those policy decisions, um, and the particular people who are responsible for doing those things, what are the sort of ethical obligations that they're under? Switching over to whistleblowing, now the, the sort of scenario where these issues would be relevant, like what they're getting at, is a little bit more broad because now we're talking more about uh, any employee of the business. So even people who are not entrusted with management decisions, even if it's just like middle management, not even them, um, but just sort of like your worker, right? Just someone who just has a job to do um, and uh, is not like responsible at any level of that kind of hierarchy of decision making or policy setting. Uh, these are about ethical issues that pertain to them. And it's even more specific than that. Um, in whistleblowing, we're always talking about things in the context of wrongdoing or potential wrongdoing. So it's kind of a like, what do you do when ethics isn't happening? <laughs> like, what's the ethical response to a lack of ethics? Um, what's the just response to injustice? That's kind of part of what we're doing with whistleblowing. And that's a little different than with fiduciary duty, that debate, because that was kind of like, what should things look like ideally? Like, how? what is our vision for how things would go right? 
Um, with whistleblowing, we're still thinking about an ideal picture about how things could go right, but in the context of things not having gone right, where things have gone wrong, then what do you do? So in that way, um, whistleblowing kind of touches on a topic that's near and dear to my heart as an ethicist, which is this question about um, what do you, um, like the question of punishment. Um, punishment, a choice about punishment, is really an, another ethical decision. It's not something outside of ethics. It is itself a choice that can have moral values at stake. Um, and how to balance those out is kind of like any other ethical decision making, except that it's under unideal circumstances. It's like, what does the ideal way of living look like when the circumstances are not so ideal? Um, when we're not living in a utopia, um, when we've got some kind of uh, imperfect world that we're a part of, what's the idealistic response to a lack of ideals? I mean, that's kind of what gets going in the debate around punishment, like what's an appropriate punishment for when something bad happens. Whistleblowing is kind of similar, about like kind of proportionality of response kind of thing, um, some of the issues surrounding that. Um, so that's, that's kind of to locate the bigger picture question of what's happening here. Um, whistleblowers get talked about very often in the context of government and like we talked about with the fiduciary duty debate there's reasons for thinking that there are some possible parallels between what's going on with government and what's going on with businesses in as much as both of them are social institutions so they both have that kind of feature to them however the authority of a government is in kind of on a different playing field than the authority or legitimacy of a business so there can be some asymmetries here too but a lot of times the stuff that we're going to talk about here that have to that has to do with whistleblowing for businesses might also be related to whistleblowing in government and um, government cases of whistleblowing can be instructive or insightful for also thinking about whistleblowing in the context of a business as well so maybe you'll have some thoughts in that direction if you're kind of curious to pursue that tangent and see um, where some of the symmetries and asymmetries might be in detail that's something I'd be happy to talk about, but I'm not going to focus on it a lot in this lecture. That maybe if you want to talk outside of class or get into that with a journal entry or something like that, you could do that. Um, I'm actually going to pause the video here a little bit and see if I can't fix this microphone pop problem. Okay, so hopefully this is not too loud for you as you transition, and I will start speaking louder, and here we go. Here's that full talking volume. Okay. Um, just in case any of you were getting didn't want to blast anyone out on headphones or something like that. Okay, so um, in this uh, sort of Davis's presentation of the debate around whistleblowing, he's going to talk about when is whistleblowing morally permissible, when is it morally obligatory, and sort of where might it not be justified. And and he's going to talk about this sort of the standard model that's been given by many philosophers in this discussion around uh, the ethics of whistleblowing. And he's going to argue that it's basically counterintuitive, actually, even though it shares a lot of intuitive support and a lot of support from different thinkers and people who you know, write and talk about the subject. Um, it actually doesn't work out very well in Davis's estimation. He presents some paradoxes for the standard model um, that he thinks kind of justify us looking for a better model. And he's going to try to offer a different model of how to understand the sort of ethical landscape to whistleblowing that he thinks is more accurate, that sort of fits the cases better. And his sort of paradigmatic case is going to be this very, probably the most famous whistleblower of the 20th century, at least in America, would be um, this engineer named... Um, Roger Boisjali. I'm never sure if I'm saying his name quite right, but I'm just going to own my mispronunciation in case it is Boisjali, um, who works for Theokal. I think Martin Theokal is, was the, co the corporation that he worked for. I think that's the right way to say it, too. Um, but this is related to the Challenger uh, disaster when the space shuttle Challenger exploded um, and the Rogers Commission that was formed by the government to investigate what went wrong. Um, and Boys Jolly's case is sort of considered a sort of like a gold standard for whistleblowing, like the most one of the most clear-cut cases of whistleblowing that we've ever seen. Um, checks all of the boxes for us intuitively. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like this is what whistleblowers are for, like exactly this sort of case. And Davis is going to show like 
um, with these paradoxes how um, not only does the standard model have certain counterintuitive implications, but it has those counterintuitive implications in like what we consider as like the gold standard of, of whistleblowers, uh, Boys Jolly. So, um, and he thinks that his theory really seems to capture the Boys Jolly case like right on the nose. Uh, and we'll see what you think of it, um, and uh, and whether you disagree or agree with Davis. But that's what he's going to do. So the kind of first half of this lecture is going to be mostly about laying out the standard theory and then um, what are Davis's problems with it and then his replacement theory which he calls the complicity theory so we'll talk about that um, I also have this little note here early in my lecture notes that I'm gonna talk about this as bottom-up ethics and I, I'm gonna take a little tangent here in the lecture to, to talk about this because um, this is kind of one of the big picture um, um, I don't know if I want to call it a disagreement because it's not quite a disagreement. It's a big picture issue in ethics and ethical theorizing. Um, I, I, it's definitely one that is on my radar. I think I might have mentioned before that I am an ethicist and probably my main area of focus in my own thinking and my own writing has been this big picture question about how do ethical and moral claims receive rational justification. Like if we're going to debate these things and try to figure out what's truly good and bad and right and wrong, what is the sort of rules of the game for that debate? What counts as evidence? What can we use properly as evidence? And this bottom-up ethics is in contrast with what we might say a top-down approach. And they're, they've got very, very different ideas about how to make an argument for an ethical conclusion. Um, and with all the stuff that we've done in the quarter so far, we're in a really good position to see this distinction, to understand this contrast here. So let's talk first about um, top-down approaches. Top-down approaches would be like Kant, Mill, and Aristotle. They're, all of them are top-down for sure in the sense that they're trying to make arguments about first principles, about like the, the biggest, most universal, sort of deepest values and principles that we're concerned about with morality, and then taking those principles and values and using them as a measuring stick to figure out what to do in particular cases. So you kind of got like more generalized rules or more abstract uh, values and principles. And then you have these really concrete cases, right? Uh, specific circumstances with specific options, particular behaviors that you could be doing or not doing in that situation. Um, and those are all um, like very contingent rather than what's sort of universal. Um, but the top down approach is like, you can't, figure out how to deal with single cases until you've answered all those why questions about like well why would you do it that way what would justify that you got to kind of keep going up the ladder of abstraction until you get to universal principles before you've got sort of grounded judgments about particular cases and like I talked about with Kant, Mill, and Aristotle the thing that sort of drives them in that direction is that they're really worried about question begging um, that is like taking for granted your, the position you're trying to prove um, not taking seriously that there's controversy or disagreement about this. Um, they're trying to avoid that. But, but secondly, they're also really concerned about bias. You might remember me talking about that. That they're like, how do we know that our judgments in particular cases aren't just arbitrary or based on something that isn't truly universal or grounded or something like that? Okay, so Kant, Mill, and Aristotle are top-down theorists. And they've got arguments about why the top-down approach would be the right way to go, why this would be needed. Um, contrast that with this kind of bottom-up approach. And maybe Aristotle's doing a little bit. Nah, I mean, not really, though. This, the theoretical framework he provides is so top-down. Um, but a lot of bottom-up ways of doing ethics are to think about in intuitions about particular cases and then look for the patterns there to try to stay consistent. So instead of starting with principles and values and then applying them into particular cases, you start with particular judgments and then you generalize from there. So we're, if we wanted to figure out what's a good rule, like an abstract rule, we'd want to pick the rule that accords the best with our particular intuitive judgments. And the fact that the only way we can make these sort of particular judgments without a bigger, more abstract moral theory is with our intuitions, that's kind of the major point of contention here. 
Um, you remember arguments from Mill and Kant about why our intuitions are not ultimately authoritative, why they, they are sort of distrustful of them, that they don't want to ground their moral theories and their moral perspectives on intuitions. So if you don't want to do that, then a top-down approach, some other kind of basis on which to justify these claims um, would be needed. But some people are happy to kind of do this intu intuitively. Um, and I've mentioned before about intuitionism, and like I don't, I don't really agree with intuitionism. I don't agree with that approach. But it is out there. And Davis is a good example. A lot of people working in applied ethics do have this kind of in, intuitive ap approach or the, this appeal to intuitions as a part of making their arguments. A lot of applied ethicists are like, hey, you know, Kant, Mill, and Aristotle, they're useful. They give us some important moral concepts. They um, sort of help us frame what might need to be on our moral radar. But ultimately, it's our intuitions about particular cases that have the authority. And our intuitions definitely track with things like Kantian um, concern for respect for persons or utilitarianism's concern about happiness um, or Aristotle's concern about being a good person, good character traits, that kind of thing. Like, we have strong intuitions about those sorts of subjects, but the intuitions are where the authority comes from um, rather than the theory itself, rather than some rational judgment or, or, or something else. You saw the kinds of methods that Kant, Mill, and Aristotle use to try to justify their theories. Those are other alternatives other than using your intuitions as your source of authority. Um, but a lot of applied ethicists are like, yeah, do we really, we don't need to sort out all those theories. Just like, we can play around with all of them. All those ideas seem to matter to us. So let's just kind of, um, and this is not the most charitable way, but let's, uh, for me to put it, but let's just kind of sloppily throw them all together. Like, let's have a big moral casserole. Like, we care about utility and happiness. We care about consequences. We also care about respect and basic human rights and stuff like that. And we care about people's character traits, um, their state of character, what kind of people they are. Those are, those are just, they're all in the mix, right? The danger with that is that you don't have principled lines of uh, where you're making these judgments. So just like we saw with kind of Kant was probably the best example. If you want to say something is sometimes good, sometimes bad, to avoid having double standards or hypocrisy, you need to have some generalized rule that sort of shows where that line is drawn. And certainly, applied ethicists, and especially intuitionists, are still concerned about that. They're just kind of picking up the stick from the other end. They're starting with the particular judgments, generalizing from there, and then going back to kind of correct for inconsistencies and stuff like that. Top down are picking it up by, well, we got to figure out about the first principles first, like the bedrock of everything, and then we'll have the insight to figure out how to handle more particular cases. Um, so they're different approaches. But, and this is why I said they're not really in disagreement here. Um, yeah, there can be disagreements about how much authority or weight should we be giving to intuitions, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I like this metaphor of like just which end of the stick are you picking things up from. And we can definitely have arguments about which method would be better. But it's not as though um, people who are top down versus bottom up are like so fundamentally opposed to each other that they can't have a conversation or something. For the most, most part in topics like business ethics, we don't need to like settle those bigger meta philosophical issues um, before getting to the actual substance of the issue at hand. Um, certainly the kind of proposals that Davis is making, he's arguing for on intuitive grounds. Um, but we, if you find Davis compelling philosophically, it doesn't necessarily need to be because it's intuitive and you trust your intuitions. There's other ways uh, that you could articulate why Davis's proposal looks convincing or it actually is convincing and justified without having to do that through uh, just a brute appeal to, well, it makes sense to my conscience sort of thing. Um, because, like I mentioned before, we can have some doubts about that. We can have some concerns about that, about whether our conscience is uh, reflective of biasing factors uh, or is premised on arbitrary beliefs or double standards and hypocrisy, all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to say a few things about that. If it sort of felt like we were doing something a little different, with Davis, that's because we are. We are doing something a little different with Davis. Uh, even with the fiduciary duty debate, there definitely are intuitions floating around, but most of the arguments that were provided for the different positions stemmed from more theoretical sources. So 
Davis, I would say, is the first true intuitionist that we've really read so far this quarter. Um, so if you got questions about that, if you want to kind of talk more, I didn't want to talk too long about this. I spent 10 minutes on it just now. But um, if you want to talk more about that, that's another thing that is like flag for further conversation. Um, Kim, you're in the chat room right now. Do you have any other kind of questions about this um, big picture issue of bottom up versus top down before we move on from it? If you got questions, chances are someone on YouTube watching this later will have the same question. No, but I think I'm interested in the bottom-up strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest the biggest issue is always, um, like I said, there are plenty of philosophers who use this strategy. Um, the big question, like if you're thinking, I kind of like this bottom-up thing, I think that might be the right approach for how to reflect on moral matters or how to engage in moral reasoning. The big challenge is making sure that you've got consistent judgments that don't have double standards to them. And that's always kind of the concern, right? That like... Um, maybe my moral conscience has been sort of calibrated based on the kinds of subjective experiences, the contingent circumstances that I've been subject to. But maybe there are some other cases here that um, need to be dealt with that my intuitions can apply to, but haven't been sort of calibrated or they're not sensitive to the particulars of what's going on in that situation. So then maybe my intuitions are not going to be able to speak with as much authority about that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's going to change with each case that you add to the picture. And that might be concerning because it'll mean probably that all of our consciences are recommending something different, but they can't all be right. I mean, we're going to disagree with each other about that. And uh, to just say, well, that's fine, would be to basically endorse relativism. And we've already talked about the dangers of relativism, um, that it basically kind of gives up on the whole idea of moral truth entirely. Um, to like put it on relativistic grounds. There's no way to be wrong, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also seems like it's really substituting an arbitrary basis for belief rather than one that is justified with argument. I'm not saying intuitionists can't have answers to those questions. Um, many of them have um, tried to respond to those concerns, but those are definitely the most sort of pressing objections that face someone who really wants to defend this view. Um, you always have to be able to account for how, um, if I'm trying to make an intuitive appeal, that this doesn't just, it's not, it's like an argument that could actually convince people who don't already share my position, right? Maybe you've heard the phrase preaching to the choir. If the only people who I'm going to convince with my intuitive argument are people who have the same intuitions as me, then that doesn't really help to resolve a whole lot of disagreement. Um, but to be fair, on the other side, definitely possible that. There are some basic things that we don't disagree about. If, if there are some kind of intuitive um, common ground, then maybe that problem is not as prevalent. Um, if we come from different backgrounds and different experiences, and yet our intuitions are aligning on some things, then maybe the judgments that those intuitions inform are in a better space than the uh, intuitive judgments we make where other people are making different intuitive judgments. And then maybe those are the ones we have more doubt for. Um, my chair is actually this kind of philosopher, so I've had a lot of debates with him about it. And um, my biggest thing with talking about this tonight in the lecture was just to sort of frame how this is an issue. This is another controversy. Remember, this class is all about controversies. We're not going to settle a whole lot of things this quarter. Um, but I wanted to, I want to kind of uh, help you see what there is to debate about. What are sort of the unsolved issues in ethics? What are the things that we wrestle with? Okay, well, let's get into Davis here for reals um, now that we're a half hour into the lecture. Um, so Davis does some other useful things in terms of big picture framing for his paper. Um, talk about bottom ethics is kind of like some setup here. Well, Davis talks about these three categories of justification. And this is kind of like um, applied ethics or ethical theory 101 really, really basic terminology that he's defining for us here. 
um, we could say an action is justified on the grounds that we're saying it's morally permissible and that means it's okay for you to do it but it'd be okay for you to not do it too so is it morally permissible for me to pick my nose yeah that's morally permissible if I do it that's morally okay now you might think it's disgusting and it might be a distraction if I'm like lecturing and just picking my nose the whole time that would be probably pretty distracting that could start to become morally um, not morally permissible it could be morally impermissible if it means I'm not doing my job very well as your instructor because I'm duty bound to like try to be as good of an instructor as I can be um, so maybe that wouldn't but if I'm like sitting around at home or something and I pick my nose that's morally permissible if I don't pick my nose that's morally permissible um, is it morally permissible for for me to wear mismatching socks yes there's no moral problem with that um, not washing my car might be ugly but it's morally permissible it's okay if I wash my car or I don't wash my car nothing great like hangs on that right not to the point of saying something is morally required we also might say an action is justified on the grounds that it's obligatory that we have a moral duty to follow it it'd be okay to do not okay not to do so keep in, uh, think about it like this um, in the fiduciary duty debate you could have said there are for some of the positions they might say it's morally permissible for a company to exert social responsibility right maybe the stakeholder theory would say this sort of thing um, that <clears throat> if companies did that that's totally okay that's within their right to do that uh, managers it's within their right to make those judgment calls and use company resources for social responsibility but the stockholder theory was saying oh no 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 it is obligatory to not exert social responsibility because if you do that then you're violating this sort of promise or a fiduciary relationship with the stockholders blah 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 remember that we we're saying that the stockholder theory is really exclusive it's saying because you have this duty you cannot do these other things it would not be okay for you to exert social responsibility if you have this fiduciary duty to the stockholders that's what stockholder theory was saying so that's in the territory here of saying of talking about something that's morally required right and by saying something is obligatory means it's impermissible to do anything else okay so these things are kind of related to each other logically so keeping a promise not lying these are morally obligated we've talked before sometimes something can be obligatory but it can clash with some other moral obligation that you have and then you're really in a bind with figuring out ultimately what is the thing that morality demands out of me um, so by saying things have moral obligations doesn't necessarily settle all the questions we have about them um, but uh, the the things that are morally required are not optional if I'm going to be a moral person and by the way, we should be, uh, I, I think I might have talked about this theme before, but I think it's always useful to clarify. By saying it's not an option, um, that doesn't mean that anyone's freedom is being taken away here. The presence of moral duties doesn't take away freedom. People still have the freedom to decide if they're going to follow their moral responsibilities or not. And if they don't follow their moral responsibilities, they are doing something wrong. And it would be justified to maybe respond in some sort of way to that wrongdoing. Um, but that doesn't take anything away from people's freedom. And like we saw with Kant, I mean, Kant, it's very possible to think of freedom as being directly compatible with moral action. Okay? So doing my moral duty doesn't mean I'm a slave to morality or something like that. Like we saw from Kant, a powerful vision about how doing my moral duty is actually the way that I'm empowered to be free. A free agent to be self-determining so I just always like to remind people of that now that then Davis puts in this other category something that's not about moral permissibility or moral impermissibility or a moral obligation but about what's rationally required and Davis sort of talks about these as actions that are mandatory um, because of some non moral consideration very often people talk about this uh, in philosophy through the the word prudence they talk about actions that are prudent or imprudent, not necessarily things that are moral or immoral. Um, and this is maybe what uh, some of you, have, I think, have been having in mind when you're thinking about practical considerations. So if I'm a manager, like going back to the fiduciary duty debate, um, since we were just talking about it last week, if I'm a manager and I'm trying to make business decisions, 
I might be thinking about these moral considerations about social responsibility and that sort of stuff. Um, but then I also might be thinking like, what do I have to do to keep this business running? And those are kind of practical things, right? They're not, I don't usually, most of us don't think about um, prudent management, um, how to keep your business afloat as being a moral consideration. Now we could, we absolutely could. And actually some people were asking me about my business ethics theory the other day. Um, and that's kind of how I look at it. Um, that would be the answer I would give. Again, I'm not going to give a big lecture on Tim Linneman's ethics here. But um, we could think about it that way. It would be possible. But most of us don't think about it that way. Uh, most people I've talked to don't seem to think about it this way. That there's sort of a world of – like they think about considerations that are action-guiding, what uh, philosophers will call prescriptive reasons, like uh, rational reflection about what I ought to choose. That there are – there are prudential reasons, non-moral reasons that recommend certain actions, and then there are moral reasons that prescribe certain actions too. And we might think of ourselves as sort of balancing those or thinking about both worlds when we're trying to make a particular decision. And I think that's kind of what Davis has in mind here of talking about things that are rationally required. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm really happy about this word choice <laughs> of rationally required since um, morality is just as rational as um, non-moral considerations for action. Um, but I, give, I gave a couple what I think are examples of what Davis is going here. Turning your homework in on time, you probably don't think of that as a moral thing, but maybe just a practical thing. Like you won't get as good of a grade. If you don't get as good of a grade, maybe you don't pass or maybe your GPA is low and that shuts down opportunities for you in the future, or stuff like that, right? Um, they're really just about you trying to get what you want, maybe, um, and doing the intelligent thing that the sort of means ends rationality here of doing the intelligent thing that will help you fulfill your goals. But those goals are not necessarily moral goals. Um, something like not playing Frisbee on the, room of your, on the roof of your... This should be roof. That's a typo. Not playing Frisbee on the roof of your house is like just a dumb idea. Um, I, I, I put it down here, like, uh, actions that are rationally required are not morally obligatory. If you violate them, you're not immoral. But given other practical and pragmatic considerations, these are actions that must be taken. In other words, these are actions that must be taken not on pain of immorality, but on pain of idiocy. So this is maybe like common sense stuff of just like, this is not a good idea. Um, this will not achieve the thing that you're trying to achieve. And not necessarily talking about those goals in the context of whether they're like they've got this moral weight behind them or not. Um, Davis says he's not going to talk about this stuff. Uh, that's not entirely true. He actually does talk a little bit about these sorts of factors, what we might call practical considerations. But I do want to say this as another kind of a, a framing for where more moral controversies happen. The whole idea of there being a distinction between moral and non-moral considerations for action is itself controversial. And just to indicate the controversy, I definitely disagree with Davis about this. I don't think that I'm on the side of this debate that says uh, all of it's moral. All the things, whenever you're making a decision about what to do and you're keeping in mind things that are valuable or what you judge to be good, I think that's talking about an ethical consideration. Even if you're like thinking about just how does this stay in business, I think that commits you to a judgment that for the business to, to continue to exist is a good thing. It might not be, right? Um, like sort of getting into questions about the moral legitimacy of uh, the business itself, right? So I know it's an extreme view, um, or I'm used to people reacting to me as saying I'm taking an extreme view by saying all of your decisions and all the considerations that factor into them are moral. And if you want to debate that with me, I'm totally down. But Davis does not think so. He thinks that there is this space. Um, he, it's just not what he's talking about in this paper. He, he's just kind of identifying them to then weed them out because he wants to do a moral analysis of whistleblowing. So that's what he's going to focus on. Um, so he and I disagree about that. And it's definitely a controversy in larger philosophical circles. Okay. Um, I do think this is maybe a, a good thing to say too here before leaving this behind. Um, I have seen in some people's journals in the class um, that some of the ways that you're approaching thinking about making decisions, like in the fiduciary duty debate of like what should managers do, were really practical things, not necessarily moral things. Like 
you were just kind of thinking about um, mm, factors that influence the decision that are maybe premised from a place of self-interest um, of just like how can I be a good manager or how do I avoid getting fired or how do I um, make the business successful or have a successful career rather than thinking about sort of moral responsibilities or moral obligations. Um, and certainly, I mean, it's one question whether this space of rationally required actions or rationally justified actions that are not, that don't have a moral justification, whether they exist, but this is not like to, to say that moral considerations don't exist and it's all just a matter of practicality sort of ignores all of the things that are of potential moral concern here in these debates so um i if you want to talk about that if you're thinking maybe you're thinking that way about it too that you're kind of approaching uh choices in the business world in a kind of amoral way um i'd be happy to talk to you about that um but uh this is not really a that, that kind of perspective is a little bit of a non-starter here in the world of business ethics. Um, this is why I was emphasizing, and why I kind of liked, I disagree with Hasnas about a lot of things, but one thing I appreciate about his presentation is that he's very clear, the stockholder theory is not amoral. It's not an amoral theory. It's a moral theory. It's talking about moral obligations when it's talking about the importance of the pursuit of profit. Um, it's not just saying, ah, pff, yeah, morality doesn't really matter. Like, this is business. Business is business. It's all about money. It's not about morality. It's not taking that line. And for us to take that line seems um, just unrealistic and like un unrealistically cynical. Um, there, the cynicism I always think of as sort of being self-defeating. If you want to talk about that, if you're thinking, well, just like it, what's impractical is morality. Moral ideals are so impractical. They're not about the way the world actually works. You want to have that debate with me, I am totally game. And I would want to flip the script on that, that I think it's actually uh, proceeding in an amoral way that's actually unrealistic. Um, and usually not a position that people sincerely adopt. When I've debated with people who try to defend that position, most of the time they really do have moral values. They're just maybe not owning up to them um, and letting them sort of sneak in through the back door. Um, but if I've ruffled some feathers just now in the last five minutes, that might be a good sign. Let's get on the phone and talk about this a little bit. I'd love to do that with you. Um, I think I, I especially was willing to kind of ruffle the feathers on this issue and kind of stir the pot a little bit, I guess, maybe provoke some phone calls or emails from people. Because if you are in that boat, if you really just look at the business world in a kind of amoral way, then that's probably something we should talk about and address and like connect on at least a little bit just so that the rest of this class can actually be something more valuable. Because otherwise it's kind of, I, I imagine that much of the class might just seem like, what doesn't matter, right? This is one of those sort of gate issues. So let me know if, if I uh, got your blood pumping on that one, or you just disagree with me about it. We should, we should talk about that. Okay, all right. So then Davis asked this. It's a very interesting question. When is justification required for an action? So we can justify our actions in these three different ways. Uh, why would that be required? And I think Davis kind of makes this, like I say here, more confusing than it needed to be. Really what Davis is going for here is a very simple point. He says, well, we're, we're only really asking for justification for an action when we're worried about it, when there's some moral concern or potential moral concern that's on the radar so um, if we're talking about how uh, whistleblowing this action of whistleblowing would need to receive a kind of moral justification either by seeing how whistleblowing is something morally permissible or it's something morally obligatory um, then that could only happen in a context of having some concern about whistleblowing actually being immoral that it would be something that'd be wrong to do okay so that's actually a theme that we're going to see pop up a lot in Duska. Um, Duska is going to kind of open up his paper being like, I just, I read all this literature from business ethicists by moral philosophers talking about business on whistleblowing. And I was just like, what are these people smoking? I'm paraphrasing, of course, but um, Duska is kind of like, I always thought the whistleblower was the good guy, but everyone's sort of painting them as like this potential bad person. This doesn't make sense to me. So, I mean, of course, he, he dives into it and, and understands his opponents uh, and engages with them like any good philosopher. But he kind of opens it up that way with this sort of anecdotal story from when he was younger 
uh, and this sort of reaction to what he was reading about. But that's what Davis is talking about here too. Plenty of people have been like, whistleblowing is a problem. People should not be doing it in plenty of circumstances. And so knowing when are the circumstances in which it's okay to do that, that it wouldn't be something wrong, but then also the cases in which it actually might be wrong to do anything other than whistleblow. In other words, that it would be morally obligatory to blow the whistle. We need a theory to sort of carve up where those limits are. Uh, what are the what are the cases? What are the conditions under which it's permissible versus impermissible versus obligatory? Um, so there's some possible concern here. So what is that threat? And and actually, by the way, that's what the standard theory is going to try to do. It's going to try to set conditions for when it's permissible and when it's obligatory to blow the whistle. But so if we need a justification for whistleblowing because the action is possibly wrong. Where is the threat maybe coming from? And Davis goes through a few different things here. He says, well, it's not because of deception. It's not like these people are spies or infiltrators. Um, not something like that. It's not like they're liars, right? Um, the problem is maybe with how whistleblowers, what they do is reveal information that has been entrusted to them uh, in a way that the company wouldn't want. That's kind of the, the bottom line down here. They reveal this information, uh, and by doing that, they're going against what the organization wants. Usually, um, if the company has engaged in some kind of scandal, scandalous wrongdoing, then that will create a PR nightmare for them. Um, their profits could be at risk. Um, being able to attract certain employee, high-quality employees might be at risk. There, there's all sorts of ways in which... Um, that information getting out could harm the company. And so the company has a vested interest in that. Um, Davis uses the L word here uh, to talk about loyalty. That may be a whistleblower is being disloyal. Again, much more on this theme. This is what Duska and Larmer are going to focus almost entirely on. And I think it's a fascinating debate all by itself in business ethics is this question of does a company deserve loyalty of its employees or not is there an ethical or moral ground for an expectation of company loyalty um is that something that has some weight to it or not or on what terms right and if that is true if it is true that companies deserve the loyalty of their employees well blowing the whistle looks like at least maybe superficially as a kind of disloyal act so that's why it might and because it's disloyal maybe it's wrong so that's why it stands in need of some justification. Um, like we've seen before, we've talked about this in a few different moments uh, in the class so far, something might have a morally relevant feature to it, and it genuinely has that feature, but maybe something else trumps that concern. Do you remember my example about um, we made a promise to go see a movie together, um, and then my mom uh, gets in a car accident and in the hospital, and I'm trying to decide, like, break my promise to go see the movie with you, or uh, leave my mom in the hospital without any support, like that wouldn't be good either. So it's like, which duty should take precedence? Um, which one should take priority? Um, so there's where we need an ethical theory. We need some kind of philosophical commentary to help us sort that out. Like, why would it be right to go one way versus the other here and across maybe a range of cases so that we don't have double standards, so we're not just rationalizing or being hypocrites or something like that. So we can have consistent a consistent story here about why it's right to do here and not right to do there. Okay, so the fact that, oh, and the other detail he brings up here is that the whistleblower does this intentionally. It's not like some inadvertent thing. So for example, let's say, uh, let's say the government is doing an investigation in a company because they have reasons for suspicion and they call some employees uh, to the stand as witnesses to testify in the case and when they you know they swear them in right if you lie to um, the court that's perjury that's a federal crime so if you're asked a question about what happened at the business and you answer it truthfully um, and you sort of reveal the wrongdoing that the company's been doing that's not actually whistleblowing that's not the case that we're talking about um, because you're sort of forced to do that legally. It's, uh, there's no way in which your loyalty to the company, if it exists at all, uh, would require you to do illegal things. Just like when, even for stockholder theory and the fiduciary duty, they were saying, well, 
you can't do social responsibilities, but you have to obey the law. And in as much as the law is telling you to do things in the social interest, well, then you have to, right? There's just no question about that um, if there are those regulations in place. So that's kind of like what's going on here. Rather, cases of whistleblowing are when someone in a company um, becomes aware of some wrongdoing that's going on in the company and they go public with that information. It's something that they choose to do. It's an intentional action that then maybe betrays loyalty and thus might be seen possibly as wrong and that's why it stands in need of a justification. There's like a threat, a concern that's like maybe this action is wrong and if we think no, it's really right or it's really okay, morally permissible, then our story about why it's right, why it's justified needs to be able to deal with that threat. So just like Davis was saying earlier that we only ask for justification um, when that action needs to be vindicated against charges that it's wrong, when there's any kind of concern in the area here about it maybe being inappropriate. Okay, so that's exactly what the standard theory is going to try to do. It's going to try to figure out where to draw the line on these things and address that sort of question of like when and where is this justified. All right, and I mentioned here again, it's just a reminder, this is considered the standard theory of whistleblowing for two reasons. One, it's the uh, theory that's most cited as the standard, and it's the one that has received the most sort of conversation in the business ethics community. So it's kind of like the main game in town. There's definitely some other theories out there, some other perspectives, and we're going to see a bunch of them in the class this week. Um, but this is kind of the main one that gets discussed. And it's going to be in a two-part sort of setup. So first off, disloyal whistleblowing is morally permissible. It would be okay to do. Also okay not to do, though, when these three criteria are all met. First, condition one, S1. The organization to which the would-be whistleblower belongs will, through its product or policy, something about the operation of the business, will do serious and considerable harm to the public whether to users of its product, to innocent bystanders, or to the public at large. Like, say, for example, if a company was, like, secretly dumping toxic waste into the water supply, like, um, in, a, in a secret sort of way. No one knows about it. People at large, uh, public at large, are going to be affected by this. And this would include risk of harm. It doesn't have to be a certain harm, right? Like, I know it's definitely going to happen. It just might need to be uh, a risk. So let's say company policies are potentially negligent. Um, no harm has happened so far, but it's like there's a risk of it. And the risk of serious harm is maybe enough to justify whistleblowing, uh, along with these other two conditions. But that's what the first condition is asking for. Harm or risk of harm. And that happens in the Boyce Jolly case. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, the Theocal Challenger thing. Okay, second condition. The would-be whistleblower has identified that threat of harm, reported it to her immediate superior, making clear both the threat itself and the objection to it, and concluded that the superior will do nothing effective. And, S3, the would-be whistleblower has exhausted other internal procedures within the organization, for example, by going up the organizational ladder. So if they talk to their superior, and they're like, that's not going to go anywhere, then they might jump rank, sort of, so to speak, and, and talk to a higher up. Or at least, uh, and this is an important condition, at least make use of as many internal procedures as the danger to others and her own safety makes reasonable. The reason that this condition is added is because sometimes um, there's sort of, uh, by, by sort of challenging things in the company, you open yourself up to retribution and maybe some kind of really serious retribution, um, almost like organized crime sort of thing. Um, there, there are cases of this kind of thing happening, and um, especially looked uh, all over the world, too, um, not just in America, but there's definitely cases where this kind of stuff happens, uh, where anyone who's not going along with it is putting themselves maybe seriously at risk. So it would be unreasonable to ask the would-be whistleblower to put themselves in, like, imminent personal danger it, just in order to satisfy these, like, exhausting internal protocol sorts of things. So uh, this is a judgment call based on circumstances about how that how heavy of a danger there is to that person. Um, but if the, 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 the thing that S2 and S3 still are sort of calling attention to, even with these sort of caveats in place, 
is that there should be some attempt to deal with this risk of harm that came up in S1 in the first condition without the cost of disloyalty. You can kind of think about it like this. If the moral concern about whistleblowing is that it might be disloyal, well, uh, there's a lot of reasons to blow the whistle too, like prevent harm. That's what S1 is all about, the first condition. If we can have our cake and eat it too, that seems like the best thing. It's not like as soon as I find out about any potential risk of harm that I immediately go to the press and start, you know, going on all the news programs and blabbing about how the company is putting everyone at great risk or something like that. If there, if this is a, sometimes like mistakes are happening or people become aware of a danger that wasn't present before, and an ethical company would be responsive to that. So you'd want to use the internal systems of reporting concerns. Um, and maybe if the company is doing what they ought to do, that would be enough to resolve the problem. You don't have to sort of betray the company's trust in order to um, in order to deal with that risk of harm. So the standard theory is sort of trying is saying here that um, if you can have your cake and eat it too, that that's what would be most ideal. So try to try to make that happen if you can. Um, that's that's the sort of proposal. Okay. Um, I'm fixing up the video here again. Okay, and then if uh, if two other conditions are met, now it's no longer just a matter of what is morally permissible, okay to blow the whistle, not, but also okay to not blow the whistle. Um, if we have S4 and S5 satisfied, then it now becomes ob obligatory. So now it's like the would-be whistleblower has to blow the whistle. The employee would have to do that. Um, Okay, so, hey, Hung Mei, it's okay. Thanks for coming. Um, so let's get into this. So S4 is saying the would-be whistleblower has or has accessible evidence that would convince a reasonable, impartial observer that their view of the threat is correct. And this is definitely, I think uh, Davis raises this question too. It's sort of weird to see this condition about having evidence as being on the side of what would make the action obligatory um, instead of just like permissible. Like if I've got, um, maybe maybe the idea here, this is my best charitable reading of it. If I have suspicions, but I can't prove it, that might still be enough to uh, be permissible and for me, for me to blow the whistle that that would be okay for me to do might be okay for me to do it even if all I have are suspicions um, or like some anecdotal evidence or something like that but not the kind of thing that would like hold up in court like I don't need to put together a whole prosecuting case before I blow the whistle on something but if I am in that position well then it's like well shit now you got to do it right if it's that obvious what's happening then you must blow the whistle and this is sort of like the case of boys jolly um, and I haven't told the story yet. Um, I don't know how many of you know know about the story. Um, well, let me tell the story after we get through S5 here, and then I might be able to connect the dots um, so we don't get too distracted at this moment. Okay, so we've got one more condition. So the, the S4 is really saying you've got evidence here that would convince a reasonable impartial observer um, that, yeah, there's some, so there's some bad stuff going on here. This risk of harm is real. Okay, and then the, fi the final condition. The would-be whistleblower has good reason to believe that revealing the threat will probably, not necessarily guarantee it, but at least probably, prevent the harm at reasonable cost, all things considered. Um, so, certainly um, part of the harm that is actually considered here in the all things considered is the harm that happens to the company. So the way in which blowing the whistle, making it a big scandal would harm the company, that's a negative consequence here that's going to be taken into account. That's kind of a utilitarian um, condition that's being put in place here. Um, but this is, uh, like I say here, notice this condition does not have the implication that one shouldn't blow the whistle if there's no possibility of avoiding the harm. Like if you, this condition isn't met, it still could be morally permissible for you to blow the whistle. But if you believe that um, if you blow the whistle, it'll prevent the harm. Well, now now you got to blow the whistle. So if you have evidence and believe that blowing the whistle could stand to prevent this from happening, 
now you must blow the whistle. It is morally required. It is morally obligatory once you're in that sort of position. Okay. Before we talk about the paradoxes here, let me talk about the boys jolly case and sort of connect it with the standard model here and, and how the standard theory would sort of deal with this. All right, so a little bit of little bit of story time here, and I think this is the right time to do it because, um, like I mentioned, boy, the the case of Roger Boys Jolly and the Challenger explosion and the Rogers Commission is really this kind of gold standard, uh, especially for Davis. Um, everyone sort of likes this case as a paradigmatic case of whistleblowing, and Davis in particular is really inspired by it. So before we get into Davis's problems with the standard theory, which he thinks the Boys Jolly case really illustrates. And the advantages of his theory, which he also thinks the Boys Jolly case illustrates, maybe we should talk about the Boys Jolly case. So let's talk about it. Um, some of you may have, um, might be informed about this story, so my apologies if this is kind of a, a bit of recap. But uh, just in case there's anyone out here, there who doesn't know about all the details, I'm going to try to give you a brief sketch of what happened. So um, Roger Boys Jolly worked for a contracting engineering company, uh, aeronautical. Um, engineering company called Martin Theokal, or um, yeah, Theo I, think, oh, man, I always forget how to pronounce it right. Yeah, I think it's Theokal, yeah. Um, and Theokal uh, was contracted by NASA to make uh, rocket boosters and certain components for rocket boosters. And this is all leading up to the Challenger space shuttle mission. <clears throat> now, the different um, segments of those booster rockets need to be connected um, because there there's different stages of them, right? Um, so there are these like rings that would create seals around the connections um, at certain parts of the uh, execution of this whole thing, like when you actually like have three, two, one countdown, liftoff kind of thing. Um, when you what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, ignition, ignition. That's it. Um, once you ignite the engines then these seals need to form in order to keep the structural integrity of everything together and so it doesn't just blow up. And these rings are made of rubber and they were testing the rings under different conditions. Uh, Boys Jolly team was assigned to do this research to make sure everything was working right and was going to be safe. So they're doing you know, experimental test cases on their engineering designs. And what he found was that when there were really cold temperatures the rubber would get uh, stiff and brittle. It wouldn't be as flexible, and it wouldn't fill and seal the, these O-rings um, fast enough, and they could actually fracture and break if it was too cold. The reason why they would break is that there would be some like blowback from the explosions that are happening that the seal wouldn't be stopping and holding in place, and that uh, kind of turbulence around the ring would just... And if there's too much of that happening, then the pre the the O-ring wouldn't seal it up fast enough to prevent it from just blowing it all up um, and having complete failure. So he found this out. Um, he warned his superiors about it. He's like, this design is vulnerable in this way, um, and sort of pass it along, kind of standard operating procedures. Be like, here's what we discovered. Like these O-rings will work as long as the temperatures are in this range. If they're this cold, then it's not going to work, and it would actually be pretty serious. So he reports all this. Doesn't see that anything is done about this. Um, there's a like a team created that's supposed to be uh, figuring out what to do about this situation, and Boy Jolly is put on the team. But he quickly finds out that like they're not really serious about changing any of this. Um, they just kind of want to move ahead with production. And Boy Jolly is like kind of concerned about that, but then becomes even more concerned when um, they announce the dates for uh, the Challenger um, um, the Challenger liftoff. Because the dates that they announced for, the temperatures that were being predicted were going to be in that danger range. And so he like frantically starts calling up his superiors, his bosses, and, and the whole team is trying to do this and be like, look, you can't do this. You can't do this. This is going to be a disaster. We tested this exact thing. Um, just to do some quick connections here, right, there's uh, a worry about serious and considerable harm, right, the loss. He was like, in the experiments that they did, they're like, there's only one way this works. Uh, if, the, if the temperatures are too low, then the thing is going to give out, and 
the only outcome that could happen is the entire loss of loss of ship and crew. There's no other. I mean, this would be a complete disaster. Um, that's what their tests showed. So there's a there's a risk of harm here, and he's been he's reported it to his superiors, um, and gone and used other internal procedures here. Uh, so all those conditions are kind of being met. Um, and he has the evidence. I mean, he did these studies. He knows exactly what's going to happen. They did all the experiments, right? Um, and at this point in the story, uh, he has reason to believe that, um, well, no, uh, this hasn't actually happened yet. So, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So at this point, Boys Jolly is doing all the standard model sorts of things, using internal means, has evidence, all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and he's trying to stop the launch. And there's this really pivotal moment where um, the Theokal uh, bosses are on the phone with Boys Jolly and his team members, and they're trying to convince him, got to got to call up NASA, got to cancel the launch. This isn't going to work. And uh, and then the the bosses are on the phone with NASA, and NASA's like, so remember you had some concerns about this, but are we good? Right? They're just kind of double checking with Theokal and being like, is this going to be fine? And the bosses are like. Kind of going back and forth between the phone calls and then they decide to say yeah it's fine and then the rest is history right nasa goes ahead with the launch uh boyce jolly uh actually in his uh kind of memoirs about this he was like when i first saw it lift off i thought phew i was like i must have been wrong i must have been wrong because it's lifting off because what he predicted was that the thing was going to explode on the launch pad that's what his test showed and then of course a few seconds later it blows up in the sky. Um, but I just always imagine like how emotionally devastating it must have been for him to be like, to work on this project, to do all this work, to know what's going on, and then to think like everything's fine and then have it all go wrong anyway. Uh, it just must have been like the worst minutes of his life. Um, but anyway, after this all happens, here's where the next wrinkle comes in. Because that's already like a concern, right? Risk of harm is present here evidence about it, all that all that stuff that the standard model is talking about. But then the Rogers Commission is formed by the United States government to investigate what happened. And Theokal and Na and some NASA people are being kind of quiet about it. They're not they're they're um they're not just being like, here's what happened. They're like, well we don't know what happened. We've got to do some research and try to sort it out, do some investigation stuff. And Boyce Jolly is like, I know what happened. This is what happened. So he testifies in the Rogers Commission and just lets the whole cat out of the bag. And he is immediately fired. He is blacklisted from ever working in engineering ever again. He's like, he's getting pretty old. I think he's around 60, 65 or something at this point in his life. So it's like hard for him to start a new career or something like that. But he is immediately blacklisted from this whole thing. Um, and his life is put in, in not a good spot. And then he, he kind of decided to make his life into... Uh, a kind of a project of trying to advocate for um, whistleblowers and try to increase legal protections for them and, and to prevent things like what happened to him happen. But his story is all too familiar and common, that whistleblowers get blacklisted and they have incredible individual risk that they take on by blowing the whistle. I mean, Boy Jolly loved his job. He loved being an engineer. And then he couldn't get a job anywhere doing that for the rest of his life because of his honesty in testifying to the Rogers Commission. So uh, it's kind of a tragic story, but it also, it seems like about as clear cut a case of whistleblowing as you'd ever hope for. Um, it seems absolutely clear that, I mean, this is black and white. You've got direct experimental evidence about what's going to happen. You know what the conditions are, and then surprise, surprise, it happens. And then there's the cover up about it. And we'll talk about that. That's gonna be a really important detail for Davis, the cover up part. The part of the story that happens after the fact not before the fact. Okay, so um, then that's to be noted here. Boyce Jolly was not a whistleblower until the Rogers Commission. He's not a whistleblower in everything leading up to the Challenger explosion. In that, he's doing everything internally. He's being a loyal employee. He hasn't done any act of disloyalty. It's when he reveals the information that of what happened at the company to the Rogers Commission, that's when it's a whistleblowing case. Right, and there were a lot of people who didn't want that to happen. They were, and they were uh, actually misleading the Rogers Commission and being cagey about everything when they knew what had actually happened. 
Okay, so the lying to the Rogers Commission is, is kind of the cover-up that's going on. That Boy's Jolly just explodes with his testimony. Okay, so that's the Boy's Jolly case. Um, anyone in the chat have questions about uh, some of the details of it? I, I kind of tried to give a quick and dirty rundown of it, but um, anything you're wondering about? He's kind of a whistleblower hero. No questions. Okay. So whistleblowing is not an internal action. It's an external action. So you're only blowing the whistle if you're doing things like testifying before Congress at like this Rogers Commission thing for Boys Jolly or going to the press um, or something like that, something outside of the business. Um, raising internal concerns is not whistleblowing. Although you might see it um, like some of the moral shape of this I could imagine happening internally like let's say um, you're aware of your like middle manager you're like most immediate superior like let's say you're just kind of low-level employee and your immediate manager you know is engaged in some wrongdoing um, if you like kind of go to their superior and sort of inform them about the misconduct of your boss um, that might look like you're being disloyal to your boss or blowing the whistle on them or something like that but that's not that's not actually what we consider uh, whistleblowing in this moral debate and the reason why is that there's no act of disloyalty here there, you don't have any loyalty commitment um, or maybe we should say you don't have a moral basis for a loyalty commitment to your immediate superior you might have one to the company that the company deserves your loyalty but like you, the loyalty to someone who's engaging in some wrongdoing, that that seems less plausible. There's nothing. Uh, it's not. It'd be really weird for us to say that it would be unethical for you to involve accountability for someone to like get involved in a way that provides moral accountability for someone who's done wrongdoing. That's that's a real hard thing to to bite the bullet on. So the quick answer to your question is no. Um, internal reporting does not count as whistleblowing. It's only when you go external. Like um, take uh, take um, Edward Snowden, for example. Edward Snowden is a government whistleblower. There are internal procedures for the government about its own internal accountability. And let's say if um, if Snowden had done something like uh, report this the the behavior of the U.S. intelligence to like the Justice Department. That wouldn't really be whistleblowing. It depends on how you want to carve this stuff up, but he's still using internal procedures that way. It's when he goes public with the information, like when he, when Snowden um, sort of gave interviews and published stuff on the internet that allowed the American public directly to find out what's going on, that's when he becomes a whistleblower. He's put into that category. Does that make sense? Sweet. Cool. Okay. Um, I think this might be a good time to take a short break. And then when we get back, we'll talk about um, using the case of Boyce Jolly as an illustration, why Davis thinks the standard theory has got some explaining to do, and what kind of alternative theory does he want to put in its place that he thinks can solve these paradoxes. So he's basically, just to kind of lay it all out there, Davis's argument, he's got like the standard theory which he's attacking and his own theory which he's supporting. He's going to say, look, my opponents have some problems. They can't answer these questions. My theory can. So that's what separates it. That's why my theory would be more rationally justifiable than my opponent here, the standard theory. That's the argument that Davis is, is going to be attempting here to say it's got problems and my theory is not guilty of those problems. It can actually solve those problems. Um, so we'll see what he has to say. Okay. Okay, we're back. So we're going to talk next to here about Davis's paradoxes for the standard theory. And there's three of them. And they all kind of relate to the main um, conditions that the standard theory is setting up for um, for uh, the... Oh man, it looks like my microphone is... It's like every time I pause the video, it 
Okay, I'm going to fix this again. Uh, levels here. Oh, no, it's still at the... Do, do, check, 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 check. Okay, no, that's all right. Okay. All right, sorry about that. All right. So there's there's three different concerns here, and they all have to do with the kind of conditions that the standard theory set up for permissible and obligatory whistleblowing. So here's the first one, the paradox of burden. Okay, so if all five conditions are met, then the standard theory is saying that the whistleblower is under a moral obligation to blow the whistle. And that in itself is not really something that Davis has a problem with. We'll see in his own theory how he's going to tell a story about how whistleblowers are morally obligated to blow the whistle. But what he finds strange about the standard theory, the thing he thinks is counterintuitive here, is about um, how the standard theory is grounding or thinking about the source of that moral obligation. So this is something I was trying to emphasize in my lectures on fiduciary duty, is that if we want to say that there is a fiduciary duty to do something or any any moral duty to do something, it makes sense to ask the question, what is it based on? That's what Boatwright was really trying to dig into. It's like, if we think that there's a special fiduciary duty to the stockholders and the stockholders alone, whether that makes sense will depend on what's sort of morally at stake here. What's the moral argument that grounds that connection? Same thing here. If there's a moral obligation for whistleblowers to blow the whistle, what is the source of that? And the standard model is saying something like the the moral impetus for this obligation is the risk of harm. So the uh, the concern uh, about what would happen, right, if they didn't blow the whistle. Okay, we're going to talk about the harm issue in a second again, but. Um, if we're going to say that uh, there's some other language here that I, I think is useful for kind of wrapping our heads around this. Um, standard model is saying all five conditions are met, then the whistleblower is under a moral obligation. So um, to say something is a moral obligation is to say that uh, following that obligation is just what any decent person would do. There's this phrase that I, I've picked up from the... Um, uh, apply to eth ethicists will use this phrase a lot. Thompson, uh, the philosopher uh, uh, Judith Thompson, Judith Jarvis Thompson, she really made this famous. Um, maybe you know about the Good Samaritan story from the Bible. And it's a story about someone really going like above and beyond the kind of what we would consider the common sense call of duty. And uh, instead of talking about the Good Samaritan, like this like incredibly uh, morally ideal sort of person, Thompson talks about, well, we shouldn't ask, if we're trying to get straight on moral obligations, we shouldn't be thinking about what would the good Samaritan do as much as the minimally decent Samaritan. So this is to try to help with uh, recognizing a distinction between obligatory duties and what philosophers call supererogatory duties. Think of supererogatory duties as like the going above and beyond sort of thing. So, for example, if um, uh, if I didn't give my video lectures um, or I never graded your work or something in this class, then I'd be violating a sort of obligation about how to do my job. Um, but there's definitely some things I try to do as an instructor, like invite students to call me on weekends or in the evenings or something like that, that I think is kind of in this category of going above and beyond. Um, it's not something that is just a minimal requirement of me doing my job as your instructor. But I think it'd be good for me to do it. I think it's a way that I can serve students better, um, kind of going above and beyond the call of duty here. Um, and so it'd be maybe a super erogatory duty. If I didn't do those things, I wouldn't be fired. And, and there wouldn't be any cause for me to be fired. It, I'd be perfectly within my rights to just kind of do my job on sort of the minimal level in which it's being I'm being asked to do it. Um, but to go above and beyond might be a super erogatory duty, something not morally required, not morally obligatory, um, but something that is um, morally ideal anyway. Okay, so um, if we're saying that whistleblowers have a moral obligation to blow the whistle, then we're just saying that's what the minimally decent person would do. Um, Hong Mei is wondering what does Samaritan mean. Uh, it comes from the Bible story. The Samaritans were a um, ethnic minority 
in in the sort of Jewish period, uh, Jewish area around Jerusalem and Israel in Jesus's time. And he chose them kind of for, I don't want to go in a big lecture about uh, the Bible story, but it's actually kind of interesting. The the Samaritan, the person who does this kind of above and beyond be moral behavior in the story, does it for a Jew, someone who is of a social and cultural caste that's been kind of oppressing the Samaritans. It'd be kind of like if, um, if some, uh, some oppressed person in um, America uh, would like um, do something really nice for their oppressors. Like, I, I don't know, like maybe um, would be like a modern example of this. Like, let's say if, uh, if a black person saw a like, uh, let's say they're driving down the highway, black person driving down the highway in like, um, I don't know, South Carolina or something. And they saw someone, um, they saw a car on the side of the highway with the smoke coming out of it and person standing around being like, uh, like they're just, it's clear their car's broken down. They're, they're in trouble. They need help. But the bumper stickers on the car are like all white supremacist stuff. If that black person pulls over and helps that person, that might be getting you in the context of, of what's going on in Jesus' time and, and how he's setting up the story here. Uh, the, the Samaritan is, is sort of has no um, cultural or community connection with this person that they're helping. And actually the person that they're helping is kind of like a part of a, a group of people who are oppressing them. Does, does that make sense? Does that example work for you, Hongmei? Yeah, it sort of adds to how this is like above and beyond, right? It's not just what any decent person would do, um, but it, it's something that it, it's it's someone's doing something morally ideal that goes beyond just the basic moral minimums, that kind of thing. Like, let's say um, you're, <clears throat> let's say, um, what would be a good example? Okay, how about this? Um, you're, there's a pool nearby, so I just thought of this example. If you're, let's say you're swimming at the pool, and you, you're you the only one in the pool except for this one other little kid, and uh, the kid, don't ask like why they're unsupervised or something like that, just this is the setup here, that you see the kid uh, struggling to swim, and they're kind of at risk of drowning. If you don't go over there and help them, there's like no risk to you, right? If you don't go over there and help them, you're a pretty shitty person. Like that's violating probably a moral obligation. Any minimally decent person would go and help this kid and save him from drowning. So that that looks like a case of moral obligation. Um, if I'm in a um, let let's say uh, we're in a um, oh, would be a good example of this. Um, mm, well, like like the the car the helping the person on the side of the road thing. That's probably just a good enough example right there. I don't need to cook up another one. That's definitely going like above and beyond just the major the basic minimums of moral decency. Okay, um, what Davis is trying to say in this section about this paradox of burden is that when we take into account um, all of the risks that whistleblowers take on, like all the ways in which they're personally going to suffer as a result of trying to do this morally good action, it just doesn't intuitively make sense to say this is just what any minimally decent person would do. Boys Jolly is a perfect example of this. His attempt to have the truth be known uh, in the Rogers Commission um, threatened his own happiness, well-being, livelihood, everything. And in fact, that's exactly what did end up happening. I mean, he got screwed. I mean, all the things that you might be afraid of, they actually happened to him. So um, Davis is kind of saying intuitively to us, it makes more sense to say like, wow, these whistleblowers, if they decide to blow the whistle, they're trying to do some moral good at great expense for themselves personally. So it doesn't make sense to say that this is a moral obligation if all we're thinking about is something like them reporting wrongdoing of other people, right? And I, I think it might help to really imaginatively put yourself in the situation here. You work at a company, you become aware of some wrongdoing, are you going to stick your neck out? 
to try to do something about that wrongdoing, like possible risk of harm or something like that. I mean, the harm might be pretty serious. And from like a utilitarian perspective, the harm might be so significant that it easily outweighs whatever risk of harm you're going to meet with personally. But still, doesn't it seem like a major decision to take one for the team kind of thing? Like to, for the sake of society at large, you're going to lay down your own life and your own livelihood? That's a pretty serious decision. Um, normally, if I was teaching the whole classroom, I'd be kind of like testing the room here a little bit. Like, what would you do? You know, like, would you think it's fair that you're faced with that kind of moral dilemma? And my guess is it would be something pretty hard for you. Um, it wouldn't be easy. And it would be very easy to think like, oh, this is not fair that I have to be put in this position where I'm under this like moral obligation to do something which is going to ruin my own career and my own life. Um, does that resonate with you in the chat, the people who are here? Yes? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so so that's the intuition that Davis is trying to call attention to here with the paradox of burden. That at least with the story the standard theory is giving, it doesn't seem to, to give a story that's powerful enough to be able to justify why the whistleblower is under a moral obligation to blow the whistle, rather than just that it would be morally permissible. Okay, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is what he calls the paradox of missing harm. So there are some issues here about ambiguity about what constitutes serious harm, like in the language of the first condition there, S1. Um, but the bigger problem here is this one, right? Um, in many cases, not just weird fringe cases, but in a large number of cases of whistleblowing, the whistleblower does not have the power to avoid the harm since this, the whistleblowing might take place after the harm has already happened, exactly like happened in Boys Jolly's case. So um, he, he, when he blows the whistle in the Rogers Commission, the challenger's already exploded, like all the bad stuff has already happened. Him blowing the whistle doesn't prevent any harm. So the way the standard model was sort of talking about it was that, look at S5, right? That if the whistleblower believes by blowing the whistle that they will prevent this harm or have a chance of preventing the harm, then they're under this moral obligation to do it. But if that was the case, then most cases of what we would intuitively consider morally justified and maybe obligatory whistleblowing would not count as obligatory or justified whistleblowing since there's no harm to prevent anymore. It'd be kind of like, imagine you're in that situation where you're aware of the company's wrongdoing and you're uh, thinking about blowing the whistle and then you find out that the bad thing has already happened. It'd be very tempting to just be like, well, now I'm definitely not going to stick my neck out because it wouldn't do any good, right? There's no, there's no point to blowing the whistle. But Davis thinks, well, we still have intuitions, like in Boys Jolly's case, that he needed to blow the whistle, that that was the right thing to do and that he should have done it and that maybe he was morally required to do it. But there's no harm to prevent aka paradox of missing harm okay so that's the second problem so far so good chat we're doing okay cool awesome here's number three even when there is a serious harm present like it's not after the fact sort of thing most of the time whistleblowing fails to avoid the harm that the whistleblower is trying to prevent it is just so depressing to study this stuff historically. Like the actual cases of whistleblowing that we have, whistleblowers are just ineffective. That's the historical record. The things that they, they might blow the whistle trying to prevent the harm, but very rarely does this actually happen. Um, and if we were going to look at that historical track record and use the standard model, that would entail as a conclusion that whistleblowing is practically never justified. And... Davis thinks that's totally counterintuitive, right? If that there must be something wrong going on with the standard theory if under its conditions whistleblowing is never justified because the that you're never able to uh, to have a case where blowing the whistle will actually um, prevent the harm. He's kind of saying here in paradox three that going back here. S5, the would-be whistleblower has good reason to believe that revealing the threat will probably prevent the harm at reasonable cost. If that's the standard, he's saying 
anyone who looks at the historical record could never hold such a belief. <laughs> there is never any good reason to believe that revealing the threat would prevent the harm at reasonable cost because whistleblowers are historically so ineffective. Okay, So um, that's a big problem here too. So these are the three problems. Paradox of burden, um, paradox of missing harm, paradox of failure. This prompts the need for a different theory, and Davis is going to give it. And he thinks, uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to talk about what his theory is. We'll kind of just look at that on its own. And then we'll come back to these paradoxes and talk about how Davis's complicity theory is able to handle these when the standard model is not capable of handling it. And, and just to be clear on this, because sometimes I've, I've noticed this can get confusing for students. Davis is not trying to say with all these reflections that any whistleblower is ne like that whistleblowing is never morally obligatory. He actually thinks it really is morally obligatory, even with all the personal risk, even with all of the ineffectiveness, et cetera, et cetera. It's still morally obligatory under his theory. But what he's going to be doing is grounding that obligation on a very different foundation, a different moral foundation. Okay, so. And that's going to mostly happen through this metaphor of complicity. Okay. So, like I have say, stated here, the standard theory relies on an obligation to prevent harm, which requires opportunity and effectiveness. What if the obligation derived from a moral duty to not be complicit in wrongdoing instead? So instead of seeing the whistleblower as someone who's like taken one for the team of society to prevent some like great risk of harm or negative consequences for people generally, Instead, the whistleblower is focused a little bit more on themselves and their own moral status. Not, not that they're insensitive to what happens to other people or the wider world here, but Davis is thinking that basically you have to blow the whistle in those cases where not blowing the whistle would make you personally complicit in the wrongdoing that the company is up to. Okay, so let's, let's look at it in detail, but that's it in a nutshell. So this is what Davis says. Okay. Whistleblowing is morally required, morally obligatory, when these conditions are met. Condition one, complicity, the C stands for complicity, uh, the S up here stood for standard model. I think that's his notation uh, logic here. But C1, complicity theory, condition one, um, you're morally required to blow the whistle when all these conditions are met. The first one is when what you reveal derives from your work for the organization. So this is something to just prevent uh, whistleblowing as being something that a spy would do. Okay, so uh, he, he talks about cases here where, like, um, it, it's a part of my ordinary um, tasks or responsibilities in doing my job that I become aware of or involved in this wrongdoing that the company or organization is is up to. So, actually, Davis does not think that whistleblowing is morally required when um, say I'm uh, in a big corporation right and I work in one department maybe I work in the accounting or maybe I don't work it let's say I work in advertising and I visit you the accountant in the accounting department because you're just my friend and we hang out and while I'm there while I'm like walking around the accounting offices I'm like whoa that looks a little funny and then I investigate a little bit and I'm like oh shit I you know, like I see a memo or a, or some graphs or something like that I get I see some I become I, some information now is I have access to uh, that shows that there's something goofy going on here, morally speaking, some unethical practice on the part of the business. Um, there I'm being a spy. I didn't come across that information naturally as just a part of my normal responsibilities and duties of doing my job. I'm a spy. Now, spies may have their own moral obligations or their own kind of shape of moral issues. Um, and all Davis is saying here is just that, well, that's not whistleblowing. If there's if there's some kind of like may, maybe there is some moral reasons for why I need to make that information more public or go and talk to someone about it, maybe that's true. But he doesn't want to talk about those cases. He wants to talk about cases where I become aware of wrongdoing as a part of just doing my job, so a part of my normal work for that organization. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that I'm a voluntary member of that organization, so I choose to work there. Like I accepted the job um, with full agency and freedom. I'm not a slave. Um, I'm not being like coerced or strong-armed into it. 
um, he, uh, Davis brings up, I think, this case in the in the article about like um, if say bank robbers come into the bank and then they hold a bank teller hostage with like a gunpoint and tell the the teller to like put cash in a bag or something like that. Um, that's not a case where there'd be any like if if the person ends up blowing the whistle on the uh, criminals later, that's not whistle blowing. Um, they aren't a voluntary member of the criminal organization that's doing this bad action. Um, it's important that you're voluntary so that you have some agency in this, right? So if you continue to work for them, uh, you're acting as an agent of the company, that's you choosing to do something, and thus you're morally responsible for that choice. That's, that's the key reason for why Condition 2 shows up here. That's, that's what's at issue with the idea of complicity. Um, if you're not a voluntary member, then you don't share in the same culpability as those for whom that participation is optional. If I choose to continue working for a company that I'm aware is doing this wrongdoing, um, and I'm a free associate of that, I could back out of that anytime I wanted to, then my continued um, employment is my choice. And then I've got moral accountability for that choice. That's basically what Davis is saying. Condition three. This is the part about where I gain the information. I believe, through the, the information that came from my work for the organization, I believe that the organization, though otherwise legitimate, and that's an important condition, is engaged in serious moral wrongdoing. So there's a couple things to talk about here. One, the organization needs to otherwise be legitimate. So like a criminal, let's say I'm in a criminal organization and I call the cops on my fellow conspirators. Um, that's not whistleblowing. Davis doesn't think that's whistleblowing. It's something, and, and it's definitely a morally relevant thing, but it's not this case of whistleblowing. It's not this particular type of problem. So it has to be kind of this idea that um, if the organization uh, did not engage in serious wrongdoing, um, if it's otherwise legitimate, then this could be a case of blowing the whistle, right? And that's where maybe there's these considerations about loyalty, like that the company, if it's a legitimate company, might deserve my loyalty. An illegitimate company might not. And again, we're going to talk about that a lot more with Duska and Larmer about the issue of, loyal, of employee loyalty. But um, that's the other <clears throat> sort of meaning behind this condition about legitimacy. And then finally, in this engaged in serious moral wrongdoing, um, this is a very intentional choice uh, on Davis's part to avoid restricting this to just harm, just negative consequences, that there's other kinds of moral wrongdoing other than risk of harm. It certainly includes harm and risk of harm, like a company making a, um, uh, like a uh, product that can harm consumers, like a toy for children that can poison them or something like that. Definitely that would fall under this category. But there's other things that don't have to do with harm, like the Boyce Jolly case, where there could be serious moral wrongdoing. I mean, the wrongdoing that's relevant to Boyce Jolly's case is the lying to the Rogers Commission, the cover-up of what happened, the misrepresentation of information that was happening in, in the Rogers Commission, this investigation into the Challenger explosion. So uh, Hung Mei asked, is, is it whistleblowing if an auditor found out about some unethical issues? Um, I don't think Davis is going to count that as whistleblowing, um, but it depends on what sort of auditor we're talking about. If, um, I, it, it, yeah, hmm. I could see him going a couple different directions with this. So let's say a company hires an auditor, like an independent auditor, to do some work in their company, um, and the the auditor discovers some wrong unethical practices, um, well, they're in a kind of contract with that company, right? So it's kind of like they're under them, their employ. Um, so it'd be like they get information that if they did reveal it, it derived from their work for that organization and they're a voluntary member of it. Now, they, they're not maybe a member of the organization if they're a contractor, right? They're not an employee, but they are being employed by the company and they're a voluntary member of that agreement, right? That sort of uh, contract, uh, that contract is, is explicitly uh, a voluntary sort of agreement, right? So, and that otherwise maybe you would have loyalty to your client 
if they were legitimate. But if they're engaged in serious moral wrongdoing, then maybe not. Um, so yeah, they maybe maybe an auditor that's an independent contractor that's brought in by the company um, could count as a case of whistleblowing. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe for Davis. I could see him also going the other direction that um, the contractor doesn't owe anything to the company because they're not a direct employee. They're not like an agent acting on behalf of the company in any sort of way. Um, so they might have some moral obligations to um, reveal that information, but it'd probably fall under other general obligations of professional ethics on the part of auditors. Um, so like uh, a financial auditor, audit, auditor, auditor, um, might be under some professional ethics responsibilities or duties to um, report illegal activity to the IRS or the SEC or something like that. Um, but we wouldn't understand their moral obligation to report that stuff under the kind of model that Davis is providing here about complicity. It wouldn't be complicity. Although, and this is where I'm going back and forth. Sorry if I'm not giving a straight answer, Hong Mei, but this is kind of a tricky case to think out. Um, Davis might want to say this. If that auditor uh, has those professional ethics responsibilities, it's, uh, okay, see you, Kim. Um, have a good night. It might be because um, if they don't report the information, now they become like uh, a co-conspirator in the wrongdoing, which is exactly what Davis is trying to get at here with this idea of moral complicity. Is that making sense to you, Hong Mei? They, they kind of become an accessory to the crime if they don't report it. And, and that kind of, the, the importance of reporting it on the grounds of avoiding personal moral culpability is exactly what Davis is going for here. And that actually comes to the kind of culmination here with condition four. So, um, yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you for your questions. I think they really help. Uh, they help kind of draw out some more of the substance of what's happening here. Um, so, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this. So the, in condition three, it has to be a serious moral wrongdoing. Um, as Davis puts it like no tattling. So in other words, like making a big public stink, uh, or like creating a scandal over something that's really minor, like a minor moral egregence is not going to be justified. Um, the only way is if the whistleblowing is going to be justified is if it's about some kind of serious wrongdoing and how serious does it have to be? Well, maybe we want to talk about that. But again, remember Davis is kind of using moral intuitions here. And he, I think he would say something like, well, there might be a range of cases that are gray. They're kind of fuzzy. Like, is this serious enough? But there are definitely, there's definitely a line somewhere because there's definitely cases that are totally serious, obviously, and must be reported. Um, and other cases that are like, totally minor and not requiring that kind of step. Um, they don't require the step of whistleblowing. What about the in-between? That's eh, going to be tricky. So there's more work to do here in sort of figuring out exactly what does serious mean, trying to cash that out a little bit more. But that uh, Davis's approach would probably be to go into case studies and try to sort it out from there if he's using his intuitive approach, this bottom-up thing. Okay, but then condition four is where the real action happens. Uh, is sort of like where everything is leading to. So if I believe that my work for that organization will contribute more or less directly, it could be pretty indirect, to the wrong, if, but not only if, you do not publicly reveal what you know, then I need to blow the whistle. Okay, so basically if, if I stay quiet, if I shut up about it, uh, then I become complicit in the wrongdoing. That's the concern. And I think Davis means this really seriously. I, when I've taught this with students before, sometimes they have this reaction of like, well, I'm not really that involved with it. I mean, it's other people who are making the decision to do these wrong things. Um, I'm just sort of like getting involved tangentially with it. Davis would say, no, that's enough of a connection. You don't have to be directly perpetrating it. Maybe just your silence is sort of allowing it to happen, right? It's enabling it to happen. So he definitely, he, he's, he's going to resist 
um, ways that people might rationalize how they're not really complicit in the wrongdoing or try to give themselves an excuse or a way out of it. And he is not going to, so he, we, he does mean this condition to be interpreted in a very strong sort of way. And that's, and the boys jolly case is a really good example of that. So let, we'll, I'll talk about that more in a second here. Um, okay. Um, oh, and yeah, th uh, this is important. Uh, in comparing it with the standard model, notice how there's no thing about using internal means. That's kind of captured by C4. If uh, there were internal means in the company to deal with the wrongdoing, then um, my silence would not mean complicity. It would mean I'm able to like address the issue and deal with it without having to report it publicly. So it's only in those cases where um, if I uh, don't blow the whistle that I will be complicit, that's when I have the moral obligation to, um, to blow the whistle. Okay. And then... C5 and C6 are just saying you're justified in these beliefs and then the beliefs are actually true. And I, I don't want to get into a big philosophy tangent here, but this is actually really standard stuff for philosophers when we're talking about knowledge. So um, the, the, the most standard, there, epistemology is the field of philosophy that's devoted to knowledge, like what are the conditions for knowing something? And it gets pretty messy, it gets pretty complicated, and there's a lot of controversy in it, of course, like everything in philosophy. But the most standard model of knowledge is, we call it JTB, justified true belief. So if I form a belief about something, that belief is true, and I have rational justification for it, like evidence and things like that, then I am able to say that I know it. So... Um, do I know that there is water left in my can here of, of uh, sparkling water? Well, yeah, I do know it because I've got the belief that there's water in my can. Uh, if we're using common sense here, it's true. And I got a lot of direct evidence justifying my belief. The direct sensory evidence of observing, I see it, I taste it, I feel it, the weight of the can. Right, those things are what makes my belief justified. The belief isn't just like coming out of nowhere, but I got a basis for it, and it's true. So then I know it. So basically, what what Davis is saying is that I know that the organization, though legitimate, is engaged in serious moral wrongdoing. So I kind of like have evidence for it, and I know that my work for the organization will contribute to the wrongdoing if I don't publicly reveal what I know. I'd be complicit in my silence if I didn't blow the whistle. <clears throat> so those things have to be known. Okay. Now, he, Davis split some hairs here, and I'm kind of tempted to just like kind of gloss over them and not focus on them too much. But he, uh, maybe I'll I'll touch on it just for a minute or so. Davis does want to say that I might be wrong about this, right? I might be a whistleblower where I think there's something morally wrong going on in the company, and then it turns out after I blow the whistle that it wasn't the case. Like it looked like it, but it wasn't actually the case. So like maybe my belief wasn't true. Um, I'm, I'm, he, Davis wants to say this. I might be excusable for blowing the whistle. It's an understandable mistake. How was I supposed to know, right? If I did my due diligence, I tried to investigate it a little bit or double-checked or I was thoughtful about it and trying to figure out, do I need to do this? Do I not need to blow the whistle? And I'm trying to follow the standards and do everything right. If I blow the whistle when I'm wrong, well, then I didn't do the right thing. Davis wants to say it wasn't actually justified. It wasn't the right action to take, objectively. But it's understandable that I made that choice, and it, my action would be excusable. In other words, I'm not subject to the same punishment as if I had intentionally blown the whistle inappropriately, right? If I was, like, making a scandal over nothing intentionally, well, that would be pretty unethical. Um, and I would be maybe deserving a punishment for doing that. I'm abusing whistleblowing uh, in this sort of way. That would be wrong. Um, but I could also just make an innocent mistake about it. Like... I thought that there was something seriously wrong. I had some evidence, and it just turned out to not be the complete picture. Well, I shouldn't have blown the whistle. We can say that objectively. But we can also say it's understandable that you took that course of action. What else were you supposed to do sort of thing? Um, so the action is excusable, so I wouldn't be subject to the same kind of maybe punishment or appropriateness of punishment or something like that. So that's all he means there. If that's a little tricky, if you're kind of having some trouble with that, feel free to ask me about it if you want to talk more. But... Um, this is kind of a minor, minor point. The big, big idea 
is the sort of moral basis on which Davis is trying to ground the obligation to blow the whistle. That it needs to happen under pain of being personally complicit in wrongdoing. Not taking one for the team of society, not throwing myself under the bus as a sacrifice for some moral good like preventing harm for other people um, or for justice at large. Davis is saying the reason why whistleblowers have to blow the whistle is because if they don't, they are guilty of a moral wrongdoing. They become roped in as accessories to the crime. Um, and that is that is something that every individual person has a moral obligation to not do. You're not supposed to be involved in moral wrongdoing, ever. <laughs> and being silent can be a kind of complicity. And that's what Davis is targeting. So let's talk about this again with the Boys Jolly case. Boys Jolly uh, revealed information at the Rogers Commission that was derived that derived from his work for the organization. It was a part of he was told by uh, uh, Martin Theokol to uh, run these tests and figure out what was going to happen with these O-rings. He did it, and he the, those tests revealed that they were seriously vulnerable, that there was this big risk. Okay. Uh, he's a voluntary member of the organization. He's an employee of the company, was for many, many, many years. Um, had a pension plan and everything that got stripped away from him. It's just so shitty what happened to him. Um, but he was a voluntary member, so he chose to be a part of it. And he knew that the organization, though legitimate, was engaged in serious moral wrongdoing. Now, here's the key part. The wrongdoing that Boys Jolly was aware of we're not talking about the thing that the bosses did with going forward with the launch test, although you might be tempted to think of that as the wrongdoing. What Davis is drawing attention to is what Boys Jolly, when does he blow the whistle? He does. He's not blowing the whistle before the Challenger launch or immediately after the Challenger launch. He blows the whistle at the Rogers Commission that's uh, mandated to investigate and explain why the Challenger exploded figure out what went wrong. Boys Jolly knows what went wrong and he knows his bosses know because he told them. So when he sees his bosses go up in the Rogers Commission and say that they don't know what happened and that they need to do more investigation, he's like, secretly inside it, he's like, I know that's bullshit. I know that what they're doing is lying. They're misrepresenting the truth to the Rogers Commission. That's the serious moral wrongdoing that Boys Jolly believes and actually knows that his company, the Yokel, though otherwise a legitimate company, right? Just a contractor for NASA. There's nothing wrong with that. They're not a crime. That's not organized crime, right? But he's aware that they're engaged in serious moral wrongdoing because they're lying to the Rogers Commission. He knows this because he knows they know it because he told them, right? And Boys Jolly knows that his work for his company, for the Yokel, would contribute to that wrong if he did not publicly reveal. So when he's on the stand, if he does not reveal the information that he is aware of through the work that he did for the organization, like all that test and stuff, he, he would be lying. He would be complicit in reinforcing the lie that his bosses are telling when they went on the stand. So if he doesn't tell what he knows, he will be complicit in that wrongdoing because he knows better, right? He knows. He knows two, or I'm sorry, he knows three. Um, he definitely knows that this wrongdoing is going on. And if he doesn't tell the truth when he's up there at the Rogers Commission, he'll be complicit in supporting the lie that other people have, to have told. Is he responsible for them lying? No. But he's responsible for what he's going to do in that situation. And his silence is complicity with their moral wrongdoing. And that's morally wrong for him to do. That's why he was under a moral obligation to blow the whistle, according to Davis's theory. Okay, so that's where this is going. Um, Davis thinks he's his his view, his complicity theory does a much better job nailing the things that are morally relevant about this classic case of whistleblowing from Boys Jolly, way better than the standard model hits it. Um, and I'm curious what all of you think about that too. Do you do you think? Davis has done a good job um, creating this theory and arguing that it, it is superior. Um, another way that he wants to argue for it, though, to really like pin it down, is to uh, go back to these three um, paradoxes and show how his theory solves the, the, their problems. 
he's saying he's trying to pin these problems on the standard theory but then also show that his theory is better it can actually solve those problems this isn't a universal problem for any theory of whistleblowing but just for the standard model not for his um, but before I get into that um, chat how are we doing um, so far so good with this stuff or have, have any questions come up doing good Cool. Okay. All right. So we'll finish this off and, and we're going to be almost right on time for our two hour mark. I always try to keep it on that. Okay. So paradox of burden again was saying that if, if all that was going on here was trying to prevent harm or the possibility of harm, the risk of harm. Um, and the fact that whistleblowers just get shafted every time, like that's definitely, they, they open themselves up to great personal risk. How could we say that it's morally obligatory for them to blow the whistle? That seems totally unfair. Davis doesn't give the answer of it is unfair. He's like, well, it only looks unfair if you're looking at it from the perspective of the standard theory. It doesn't look unfair when we're looking at it from the theory of the complicity model. It is totally fair to ask people to not be complicit in wrongdoing, to not become accessories to crimes. That is something that we can ask of them. Is it somewhat tragic? Um, is there is there some kind of um, metaphysical unfairness that some people are faced with those moral decisions and other people are not? Some people are opened up to being put in this position. Like, imagine being Boyce Jolly, and you're up there on the stand of the Rogers Commission. Your bosses just really put you in a tough spot. If they didn't tell the lie that they did, Boyce Jolly might not have had to face this issue of whistleblowing at all. But because they lied... Now he's in this position where he is personally culpable for moral wrongdoing. And I think Davis might say, yeah, we might sympathize with that. We might say that's a tragic situation while still saying, yeah, they do have a moral, whistleblowers have a moral obligation when they're in that situation. Um, it's too bad that you work for shitty bosses or a shitty company that does this wrongdoing and then um, tangentially ropes you into it. But, but Davis is, is, sort of playing on our intuitions here that like this does this is much more plausible if it's a matter of personal moral accountability it's more reasonable to at, to make this moral demand of people is it still a tough thing to do yeah it is a tough thing to do but sometimes moral obligations are not convenient um, it's not like everything that morality demands of us is something that is easy for us to do um, it might be hard to do it. Uh, and there's plenty of other examples of this. If, if that does seem kind of counterintuitive, just imagine living in Nazi Germany, like at the time of Hitler's rise to power. I mean, you the, the risk of complicity with the evil things that the, the Nazi regime is doing, like imagine you're not a Nazi, right? You're like, you have enough moral perspective that you can see that the Holocaust is wrong. Um, imagine what it takes what kind of moral courage it takes to not become complicitly involved in that wrongdoing. You're under this kind of obligation to resist it. But as soon as you do that, you put you and your entire family at risk. I mean, that's a, that's a really, really serious problem. Um, and it is a kind of um, unlucky situation to be in. It's, it's not entirely fair. But we definitely think that there were moral obligations that the German people had in this time period in that situation. And that if they allow this dictator to take power, they're not fulfilling their ethical responsibilities. Morality does demand some things of us that's not just a sacrifice of conveniences, um, but can maybe hit really close to home. Um, imagine, um, yeah, I mean, we could, I could create cases all day long here about situations where you're faced with being involved in some serious moral wrongdoing uh, or standing up for it and putting yourself at risk. I mean, even just a kind of schoolyard situation of bullying, right? You see one kid getting bullied by another kid. If you don't do anything about it, you're kind of being complicit in that wrongdoing. It feels like there's a moral obligation here to intervene, right? Um, and that to just be this bystander watching it, that's not justified. That's not appropriate. A lot of people who write on this subject in moral philosophy often bring up this really famous case I think from the late 80s I can't remember the name of the victim it was a really, it's a very famous case but this woman got brutally 
stabbed to death on the streets of New York while about two dozen people watched. Just passers-by. And it's like this classic case of bystander syndrome where uh, people were like in a position to help. They could have done something. Would it have put them at personal risk? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But to say like no one did anything, there's a huge moral failing that's going on there. Like it's it's incumbent on everyone to intervene in a situation like that. That that might be morally required. Very inconvenient. But maybe that's morally obligatory, too. There's a lot of room for debate about this sort of thing, but that's going to be Davis's line here about paradox of burden, that it makes more sense to see whistleblowers under moral obligation if we're grounding that obligation on this duty to not become complicit in wrongdoing personally rather than an obligation to society at large or this taking one for the team kind of thing. Okay, paradox of missing harm. <clears throat> um, this totally um, fits because uh, Davis has not restricted the moral impetus of wrongdoing to just be a matter of harm. Could be like lying, right? Could be a cover-up. That's morally wrong too. So his, uh, remember his, under his theory here, right? <clears throat> C3, you believe the organization, though legitimate, is engaged in serious moral wrongdoing, and that's a much wider scope for moral considerations than just harm. Okay, so that's dealt with pretty easily. And then the paradox of failure. Again, if... The whistleblower is justified in blowing the whistle to prevent harm. That seems to be a problem of any case of whistleblowing in which there's no harm to be prevented. In Boys Jolly's case, there wasn't any, the challenger had already exploded. The risk of harm was already over. It's a moot point. But there's something that's not a matter of harm, but still of moral imp importance, and that's the cover up and being complicit in this lie that's taking place. So even if your whistleblowing doesn't correct that wrong or say the accountability for the people who deserve accountability never happens, you still did the right thing. Even if you're like, like the taking the one for the team, <clears throat> if you take one for the team and nothing happens, that's going to be really frustrating. And you might even doubt whether you should have done it to begin with, right? Should I have even blown the whistle if nothing was going to happen? Davis is going to say, whoa. It's not like something ha didn't happen, even if all these other consequences didn't happen. The thing you always have control over is whether you are personally morally accountable for this wrongdoing. You're involved with it or you're not. And if you blow the whistle, the one thing that's guaranteed is that you will not be complicit in the wrongdoing. And that is a worthy enough purpose in its own. So there's no way, there's no possibility of failure. That's kind of the way Davis would say. Under my theory, whistleblowing never fails on the grounds that it's still doing something of moral importance. If it can also create change in the world, prevent future wrongdoing, all this kind of stuff, gravy. Awesome. Definitely that's morally relevant, Davis would say, but it's not the ultimate foundation on why you must blow the whistle Okay, in those cases that meet those conditions. All right, so that's Davis. Um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about it. Um, whoop. Um, and everyone jumped, <laughs> except for Hong Mei. Hello, you're still here. Uh, do you have any leftover questions about what's going on with Davis, um, his criticism of standard model, his complicity model, uh, and why he's able to solve these problems and how he deals with this Boy's Jolly case? Cool. Awesome. I'm happy I was able to explain it well for you. Um, all of you on YouTube, as always, if you've got questions left over, um, I'd like to answer them for you. Um, by the way, um, oh, I need to give out the code. Um, <clears throat> code. How about Swedish fish? It's on my table. Swedish fish. Um, so that's the code um, for tonight. I did want to say this um, about the reading comments and kind of leftover questions and hanging threads. A lot of times on the reading comment, um, I don't always post responses. Sometimes I have in a couple cases with certain students uh, and what they've posted. I've given you some feedback, like answering questions, things like that. Um, but I oftentimes think that a lot of the questions or comments that people make that I think might be evidence of a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of the reading or something like that, I imagine would kind of get clarified by the lecture, or that's my hope. But I always I want to kind of put it to you that <clears throat> if... The lecture, like let's say you had some questions 
um, and or comments that you wanted that kind of talk about. And if they don't get addressed in the lecture, they're kind of left over, they're hanging threads. Um, please, that'd be all the more reason to to reach out to me and try to connect outside of class a little bit outside of class, uh, but to like get on the phone with me or email conversation or something like that. Um, I really uh, the class doesn't have any tests or exams about what we're studying, so I'm not like grading you on your understanding of this stuff, but I want you to understand it. I mean that's part of the point of the class. So. Um, uh, adding exams on everything else we're doing is just unreasonable. It's like if I want to do one thing, I can't do something else. So I've chosen to focus on giving you the chance to do your own original philosophical work, do your own philosophical writing in the class instead of just comprehension exams and things like that. But I do hope that the, this stuff makes sense. And the material is tough. I mean, this is challenging, complicated philosophy. And uh, if you do have questions about it or think that maybe you do have some misconceptions, I would be so happy to help you work that stuff out or at least confirm for you, like, yeah, you're thinking about this the right way. Um, some of you I've been doing this with with some comments and stuff on journals and things like that. But um, definitely I want to extend that invitation. Uh, that invitation is always out there to you. Um, uh, if you want to kick the stuff around more, I'm always down. I think I've said this in almost every video. Maybe you're sick of me saying it at this point. But... I'm going to keep saying it because I've learned from experience that it's a good horse to beat to death um, to uh, just keep extending that invitation. I really like working with students. I hope that's really clear. Um, so please uh, please reach out and talk whenever you want to. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, all right. Well, uh, see you, everyone, on YouTube until Thursday, um, which we'll do Dusk and Larmer.